Hi, I'm Pilar, the volunteer manager at Friends for Life. Welcome to your first step towards becoming a Blue Shirt volunteer. We're really excited to have you. In this video, we'll go over a little bit about the history of Friends for Life, we'll share with you our mission, and we'll explain why our Blue Shirt volunteers are so vital in helping us carry out the mission. We couldn't do it without you. So what if you started a business and every expert in town that had ever been associated with that kind of business told you that you were going to fail, that your idea was no good, that more than that, you would not just fail, but you'd be humiliated and probably bankrupt. What would you do? If you believed in your idea enough, would you go on? At Friends for Life in 2002, we were in exactly that situation and we went on. We've gone on to thrive, and we've gone on to get to have this conversation with you. Every movement, every great movement, begins with one idea. And the idea that Friends for Life was founded on is that we wanted to offer an alternative for the animals of Houston to the shelters that were killing so many animals. And the way that we evolved was very grassroots. I had an idea and I communicated it to two friends. I know this is crazy. I know no one's done it. What do you think? And they said, we're in. Those are the kind of friends you want to have. So Friends for Life began in 2002. And we evolved in a very different way. In fact, we evolved in a way that I have never known any other shelter to evolve. And that's, we didn't begin with animals. We began with a plan. And so we incorporated in 2002, and we didn't take our first animal until 2004. What we did was travel the country and learn about how to do it. So in 2004, we came back to Houston with a plan, and we took this no-kill plan to the directors of that time, the three big shelters in Houston and we were pretty sure they were gonna love the idea. And it didn't exactly work out like that. Um, they told us that Houston wasn't ready, that Houston would never support a no-kill shelter, that this idea wouldn't work, and we'd be bankrupt. And we really had to do some soul searching, but we believed in our idea, so we went ahead. As you know, Houston was ready, Houston is ready, and we're doing it. This culture of underdogs and revolutionaries is based on three words, every animal matters. That's the yardstick by which we measure everything we do for the animals. The question we ask ourselves is whether what we're doing has the best interest of each individual animal at heart. And if it does, that's the action that we take. It isn't that group that came in on Wednesday and needs to be out by Friday. It isn't a group of ringworm cats or behavior dogs. It is, what does Reggie need? What does Julio need? What does Mufasa need? Because we happen to believe that each one of these animals has a right to live and a right to be treated as an individual. And we have 25 staff members at Friends for Life, but we have way, way more to do than 25 staff people can accomplish. And that's where you come in. At last count, the blue shirts provide over 11 full-time staff equivalent positions. That's extraordinary. And in case it's not obvious, we absolutely could not operate without you. So what you're preparing to do to become a blue shirt is enormously important. Important to Friends for Life, important to the greater picture in Houston, and important to the national stage. The blue shirt that you'll earn through this training will make you a part of a tribe. We mentor 24 other shelters. We now mentor three municipal governments, and we have two international shelter partners. The blue shirt that you'll earn is unique to our volunteers. I don't own one, I can't get one. 
Staff doesn't have one. It comes from volunteering your time and your talent and going through a fairly rigorous set of training protocols. I want to close by telling you a story that is my bar none favorite story of how important these shirts are. As many of you know, we were asked as a shelter to direct the animal response at the city mega shelter during Harvey. And it happened at George R. Brown. Ultimately, we triaged 671 animals in the first 24 hours, 1,500 animals in two weeks. Our protocols were the protocols that Friends for Life uses every day. It went so well that we participated post-storm with the Red Cross and Louisiana Search and Rescue and the USDA to write the national manual on cohabitated shelters. Because what we accomplished in Harvey, and we didn't know it at the time, was the first cohabitated shelter in the country. So the story is this. Jamie, is one of our blue shirts, and Jamie and her husband had two 70 pound dogs. And Jamie, being somebody who was trained to prepare, a week before the storm had ordered two muzzles and two life jackets for her dogs. They watched the water rise around their house for 24 hours. Then it started to come in. Then it started to rise in the house. They were sealed in their neighborhood. And ultimately, Jamie, her husband, and her two dogs spent 24 hours on top of their dining room table while floodwaters lapped just under the table and they frantically called because they were two adults with no children and no human medical issues they were put at the bottom of the rescue list so finally finally a swift boat arrived to pick them up the swift boat had to break out their front window and literally boated into their living room when they saw these two big dogs the rescuers hesitated Jamie pointed out the muzzles on the dogs, and those muzzles were the dogs' passage. They all got on the boat, and it took them, in the pouring rain, hours and hours and hours to get to the drop point where the whole family was put on the back of a City of Houston dump truck. They drove there in the pouring rain to be taken to a shelter. They unloaded from the truck, walked the dogs to the front of the shelter to be turned away because the shelter wasn't accepting animals. They got back on the truck and in an hours long journey, they finally ended up at George R. Brown. They were soaking wet as they filled out the registration forms. They were delighted at GRB. They could bring their dogs, but they were exhausted and the lines were long. And Jamie started to think, this has really been, it's been a mess up until now. I wonder what kind of group is taking care of the animal part. We don't have any food, any kennels, any beds, any towels. I think one of the dogs has cut his paw. I don't know if there's gonna be medical care for them. I wonder if it's gonna be better organized in the first part of her journey. And so she asked her husband to hold the dog's leash so that she could walk all the way up to the front of the line to see who was in charge and what the animal intake looked like. She said when she got near the front of the line, she peeked around the corner and all she could see was a Friends for Life blue shirt. And she said at that moment, she burst into tears because she knew what a blue shirt meant. She knew things were under control and the blue shirts were in charge. And she said that was the first time she had felt calm in a week. So it's going to look like a t-shirt when you get it, but it's really more of a superhero cape. You all mean a lot to us, and this program means a lot to the animals. Thank you.